All right, so uh, my name is uh, Samet Khanna, um, and I'm going to be doing a talk on building web service frameworks in Scala for uh, sensor networks. So this is specifically a project called Big Sense that I worked on a few years ago with some people at the University of Cincinnati. So um, what we're going to be going over is just a review of servlets. Um, everyone's probably familiar with this if you've worked with web applications. Just looking at basic servlets, looking at web frameworks, um, talking a little bit about stormwater runoff, sensor networks, and then the big sense, uh, which is the majority of this presentation, and the framework I developed for it. So everyone here who's done some degree of web development has probably worked with one of these uh, frameworks. So Java server faces, uh, Axis for web services, REST easy for web services, um, Struts, Play, or Spring MVC. Um, there's also Lyft. There's several web services out there. They're all based around the HTTP servlet, though. So everything is built on top of this servlet. And so usually most of these frameworks just build a set of libraries around that servlet for your own custom configuration files, controllers, models, and views. Um, with the exception of Play2, it's one of the few frameworks that has its own container. Um, now you can wrap Play2 apps in war files, but natively they run on top of uh, Netty, and they kind of have their own container system. But other than that, most of our Java apps run out of war files, where you can package several war files into an ear file. Uh, you have a web XML, you have a web INOP with all your classes and jar files in it. Um, so they all have the same basic structure. This is an example from uh, back in uni um, in my CSC 202 class, where I just had a basic servlet. So um, yeah, way back in the day where I was outputting HTML directly in the servlet. But basically, I overrode the uh, do get, and you have a request and response. And uh, this program still works on a modern Tomcat 7 instance. I used to run it on Tomcat 3 back then, where it would crash a lot. So this is how. So that's just a basically a basic servlet. So most of your frameworks are built on top of this. So to build a uh, servlet just on top of the servlet API, you usually override one of these functions: do get, do post, uh, do options. Um, all of these are dispatch, or all of these are dispatched from a service function, and so mo a lot of times you never have to deal with this directly if you're using Struts or JSF. They already override all this and build a framework on top of that. Uh, for REST services, um, I started using REST Easy when I was at one company when we were making a REST service for software licenses, and so with REST Easy, it uses annotations. So here you see at post and then at path. So you have the method and the path listed in these annotations. And then you have a body which takes in certain arguments based on what you put in your annotations. So these annotations kind of fit around what we saw in that base servlet. It abstracts that, but it's still overriding these do post, do get methods. Um, if you look at the post and delete in this section, they're pretty similar. Um, I had the same kind of setup for both of them. And what I really wanted to do when I started making my own framework was kind of invert this around. I wanted the controller to be able to just take in a request and then figure out what to do with it, whether it was a get or a post, and kind of invert this whole uh, system. So this is all based, so all of these are dispatched from the service function within the servlet API. And in the documentation, it says you shouldn't need to override this, um, but it doesn't say you shouldn't necessarily. And so I kind of want to know what it did before I started playing around with this. And you can get the API for it. Um, and so there is some housekeeping, but all it really does is check to see uh, last modified times. And really this depends on you implementing get last modified in the servlet, or a lot of frameworks implement this out into the framework. Not a lot of people actually set this, but this is for browser caching. So it can do a head request and see if it really needs to pull a page again. But other than that, it's just straight dispatching. So when I started working on my service, I went ahead and just overwrote the uh, service method. So some background on sensor networks. So this started, um, I met this person at, uh, at someone's birthday party. And he worked at, uh, or he was a PhD student at the University of Cincinnati. And he was talking about how they needed to monitor stormwater runoff. He had gotten involved on this project uh, with one of his, advise, his advising professor and someone else who was working with the city uh, who had been working with sensors before. So Cincinnati has what's called a combined sewer system. The sewer and the rainwater runoff are combined to the same piping structure. Uh, there are over 700 cities in the United States that are like this. There are thousands of cities around the world that have this system. Um, the alternative to this is having separate uh, systems, so your rainwater drains, up, drains directly into your lakes, and then your sewage is separate and treated. 
The advantage of this system is that you are treating all your water. So rainwater runoff is really bad um, about just all kinds of pollutions or pollution is in rainwater runoff. You have salt, sediment, uh, oil, all the stuff that comes off the bottom of your car, um, all the rubbish that gets washed into the streets. There's a lot of pollution that just gets into rainwater runoff. And so this way you can pump it all through a treatment facility. And so all your water is getting treated before it goes back into the water system. The disadvantage to this is that during a heavy rain event, you get overflow. There's no way that treatment systems can manage lots of rainwater. Um, and so when you get into flood type conditions or even just heavy rain conditions, a lot of times these systems will dump the raw sewage and the rainwater into the river at the same time. The idea is that if you have enough rainwater, it will dilute everything, and that's it, old sewage systems depended more on dilution than it did with treatment. But uh, in Cincinnati, this became a huge problem because the pipes were so badly designed that they started backing up into people's basements. And the city got sued, they lost the lawsuit, and now they're required to clean up any uh, backup that occurs in people's basements. They even had to mail out refrigerator magnets to let people know that they're required to clean up anything that ends up in your basement and take care of it. So Cincinnati needed to find ways to reduce uh, rainwater runoff and to deal with the system. And one of the things they wanted to experiment with was with permeable pavers. And before you can start ripping up uh, pavers and start replacing it with more permeable surfaces, it's good to know which ones are really useful. Um, so just a quick view of the uh, combined sewer overflow. This is the combined sewer overflow in Cincinnati. So these grates were supposed to open up under pressure once the stormwater uh, got to a certain level. A lot of the old grates have already been uh, ripped off. Um, I wasn't here when my friends filmed this. Andrew and Tim filmed this. And I uh, said it was forever snow. Um, but this is after a heavy rainfall. And so this, you can see kilometers of water just being dumped out. And as they go over the stem, you'll actually see the suspended solids um, pretty much and leaves and all kinds of stuff going directly into the, uh, into the drainage system. So it is a huge problem. So the Civic Garden Center is a nonprofit in Cincinnati, and the Civic Garden Center um, had this green learning station, which was an educational facility. And they wanted to, they, they did a lot of community work and a lot of education, and they wanted to, uh, the city wanted to work on them with this project where they laid down different pavers and actually tested each pavement type to see which ones were the best at, at um, preventing water from being run off into the, into the sewer systems. So we used embedded Linux systems running OpenWRT and OneWire sensors to use for accounting and temperature sensors. So this is the actual facility that was built. Um, and so it's, it's a, it used to be a petrol station and it was owned by the garden center and it's been turned into this full parking lot. So we have six different pavement types here, and you can see each individual paver. Um, they all have liner on the sides of them, and they're all about, I think they're all about three feet deep total. Um, so each, so on the left we have permeable asphalt, and then I think that's permeable concrete. The middle is the control, it's just straight concrete, so it's non-permeable. Um, and then three types of permeable cobblestone. At the end of each paver is a sewer grate, and it actually fills up with water, it has a pump in it. So after it's filled, there's a, there's a float that will trigger, and then the pump has a counting sensor in it. So it has a small tipping bucket, and each time that it tips over, we know that that volume of, of water has been pumped out. Uh, it's using a magnetic read switch sensor, so a magnet flows over these two wires, and that's what triggers the, the count. There's actually a watch battery in each one of these counting sensors, so it maintains the count even after power outages. So power can be cycled, and it will still have the same count. Um, there's another view of it. So this was also set up as a full educational facility. Kids come here on school field trips. Um, there's a, a rain containment vessel on the left. Um, they have a couple of bioswells to hold water after it's being pumped out of this area. And then here's a top-down view. So it is being used as a full parking lot. So we get all the standard pollution that you normally see uh, coming off of cars in a parking lot. So each of these zones was about uh, 8 meters by 14 meters. Um, so there are five zones together that were usable. There's a sixth zone that was at the wrong angle, so we never really used it in our study. Um, so you can see all the... There. So each um, of these individual pools, it had liner in it, it had about uh, 0.3 meters of cobble-sized rock, 0.3 meter, meters of gravel, and then 0.3 meters of pea gravel um, all together. And so this is the standard kind of 
layering used in most modern parking lots that are built today that are meant to be more permeable and environmentally friendly. You'll find something similar to this uh, layout in parking lots around the world. And so uh, here's a good just overhead map of all of our sensors and the way that everything is laid out and GPS coordinates for them. So for our sensor relays, we just used regular home routers, Linksys, Netgear type routers. We just found ones that had the hardware we needed on them and reflashed them to run OpenWRT. So we had our own little embedded Linux. These things are actually pretty powerful. I mean, they're pretty cheap. You can buy them off the shelf for like, you know, 30, 40 bucks. But they've got, uh, some of them have between 300 uh, to 400 megahertz MIPS processors in them. Uh, most have about 8 megs of RAM. If you get the good ones, you can find some with 16 megs, or not RAM, but flash, 8 megs of flash. Some have up to 16 megs of flash. This one has 32 megs of RAM. Um, if you hunt around, you can find some with a 64 meg of RAM chip on them. Uh, they've got Ethernet. They've got wireless. Um, the ones we were looking at had USB. There's several of them that have USB now. Um, so here you can see there's our one-wire adapter, the blue thing hooked into the USB, and the temperature sensor is kind of at the top there hooked in. Uh, so one wire is really neat. It uses only one wire for communicating both data and power. So data and power run over that same wire. They're not very fast sensors. They take about a second to return data back. We're doing a sample rate of about one sample per minute. So that's perfectly fine for what we're doing. Uh, we met up with some contractors who had set up massive amounts of one wire sensors on pieces of wire that were kilometers in length. They didn't use them in grain silos in China to measure moisture content in these grain silos. And so with over a kilometer of these sensors, they're all multiplex on the same wire for both power and data. So it would take uh, over an hour to get all the data back, but I think they only did like two or three samples a day. So it's a, it's a slower protocol, but it's really neat because it works over just one set of cabling. So this was an original concept idea for how our sensors are going to be set up in these pits. Um, this is absolutely nothing how it's actually set up today. I couldn't really find a more modern uh, layout. But the basic idea is that we had wires that would go down underground into these uh, sewer pits. And then next to the sewer pits, we would have each of the individual temperature counting sensors and so forth. And they would all go back to a relay that was in the main petrol station that we saw earlier. There are plans on putting other types of sensors in there that we never really got around to. So this is an actual rack with all of the routers. Um, we found we didn't use the Linksys router we saw earlier. We found some cheaper ones uh, that had some of the more specifications we need, needed. So we have these punch down boxes that go out to the actual individual sensors. They come back to this relay station, uh, which is nice and dry. And uh, so we have into each one of these USB of, uh, hubs, we have one of the one-wire uh, sensors and also a USB flash drive. And that basically held all of our logging data and it held a local buffer. So if we lost connection to the web service, it would just buff buffer everything in a SQLite database. And then once it got connected again, it would push all that stuff back out. So data flow, um, we've talked about a little bit. There are one-wire sensors that go into this conversion. The OpenWRT-based uh, Relay would just have a Python application on it that would encode that in XML, store it in a buffer, and then from that buffer, ship it off to our web service, and then from that web service, it could go out to applications. So for the point of this lecture, we're not going to talk about the Python client. We're just going to talk about the Java piece, um, which is all the stuff in green in this data flow diagram. So when I started making this web service, um, I looked at a lot of the other frameworks I'd used. I decided to, because this was a volunteer project, um, and it was really neat. I really wanted to learn Scala. I'd heard a lot about it. I decided to do it in Scala. Um, looked at some existing frameworks, but just decided to try to write this one out on my own to learn more about frameworks and to try to get what I needed out of this and, and to fit the problem we had. So I decided to build something that would have uh, actions, validation, and security. So there's a bootstrapping servlet that pulls everything together. Actions are kind of like my controllers. Validation validates the inputs before it hits the actions. There's a security layer that does, uh, I just use RSA security, so I sign all of the XML envelopes. Um, and then there's some data pieces, including formatting, conversions, and models. So we're going to look, take a look at all those. I'll kind of show everything from the bottom up and then glue everything together towards the end. So most web frameworks that we use have some kind of wrapped up service request and response objects. Um, they usually wrap the standard HTTP request response. So I kind of did the same thing. 
So I created this action request that would just have the method, uh, arguments, parameters, models, data, a format if there was one, a signature, a uh, two-string function to show everything. For the response, um, had an output or possibly a binary output with a flag to indicate which one, a view, uh, the status, 200, 201, so forth, 404. Uh, location, so in REST, whenever you post something and it's created, you kind of want to return in the location header a get variable or the, the path to where you would do the get to get that information that was just put in. Uh, view data and content type. Uh, one of the things that isn't designed very well about this is that I really shouldn't have this true-false flag for binary output and switch between the two. A better Scala way to do this is just to have a base trait. So in Scala, uh, you don't really have interfaces or abstract classes. They're combined together into traits. So a trait is a combination of that abstract class interface. And so I really should have just extended a base trait, had a binary output trait, a template output trait, a string output trait. And then in Scala, you can do this match. So you can take the output and match it on what type it is. Uh, similar in Java to doing, is this an instance of? Um, and so that, that's probably something I'll incorporate in the future. This is a standard action I put together. So uh, the master server calls run action, sends in that action request we com committed, um, checks the arguments and sees, am I getting the latest? Am I looking for a timestamp range? Or I'm just making some standard calls to the database and returning that information. Notice at the bottom, we have this response. So in Scala, the very last line is actually your return value. Um, at the t up at the top, it's not required to put a return value, but you can do a colon after your function and place the return value here. That will ensure in uh, compile time checking to make sure that that return value is there. So this uh, having the last statement be the, the return type, you see that in a lot of functional languages um, and also in Visual Basic. So, um, <laughs> and so, uh, so here's just another example of, of an action. Here is one that has a post and a get. And we're doing the same type of thing where we're looking through, seeing our arguments. And so there's no validation in either of these two. And so validation is kind of out on its own. Um, I, I add in validation. So there's a validator trait that has one function called validation request. It takes in the action request. In Scala, there's this idea of that you really shouldn't pass around nulls. I'm sure all of us have been working on programs and we're like, why am I getting a null pointer exception? Th that function doesn't throw a null. You check the documentation, oh, that does throw a null. That's great. And you really shouldn't have to check the API and the documentation to see if something throws a null. There are a lot of other languages like Haskell that have a maybe type that's similar to this. And so with an option type, um, you say that something returns an option. So we can either return an instance of this class or can return null. Or return, sorry, none. And so if we look at this validator right here, um, so basically this is just checking my arguments, making sure the lengths are right, making sure we have valid date times. Um, so anytime I'm doing a return, I'm returning sum and then the validation error. So sum is a case class, so I don't need to put a new behind it. But, so I'm calling sum, and so sum is a part of the option. So with an option, you can turn sum or none. And then to check this, in our calling function, we do a match. So uh, this, is, this function returns an option, and I match it. And if it's none, I do something. If it's sum, I can do something else. You can also have an option of a base trait, and you can have several sum statements for each implementation of that trait if you want to check for several types of that option. So it's pretty versatile. You can also do a get or else, um, and a get or else will Get, get the uh, value if there is a value there. If not, if it's a none, it, you can give it a default value to hand you that instead, which is just another piece of uh, syntactic sugar in Scala. So I also had formats. So for this particular uh, piece, we wanted to output things in some pretty simple form formats, tab delimited, uh, which I specified by txt, comma separated, CSVs, table HTMLs. Um, some things didn't have a format. You had some things where you had unsupported formats. And we also had a custom XML format for putting data from the client into the web service itself. So here is an example of the format trait implemented. Uh, so this, so everything in the format, everything that extended the format trait had a render function and a load function. So this is for the XML data. This is our custom XML format. So one thing you'll notice is that we have XML in the code in Scala. That's right. There's XML right there. So this is kind of one of those things, if you look up Scala and XML, this is one of these huge debated points. Some people really hate this. Some people really like this. There are advantages and disadvantages to this. 
Um, so each one of these tags is actually parsed and it's replaced by a Scala object for XML. So you can actually just make the node objects and kind of get the same, uh, same response. But here you can clearly see the XML. You can tell each one of these is an object because we can see yields and closures and iterators all over these. Um, so the advantages you do have XML support in the code. Disadvantages are making parsers for this. If you're making syntax highlighting in Eclipse or IntelliJ or whatever, it is a bit harder to write syntax highlighters for this just because of it. Um, and also in Java, when you're making your Java applications, you can change out your XML parser. I can use SAX, I can use DOM, I can use JDOM. I can choose to change out my handler to use a different parser. Here, if I choose what's in Scala, I'm kind of stuck with what's in Scala. You can look at the benchmarks. Some of them show that it's faster than some, slower than others. But the advantage of SACS is you can use it for streaming, parsing, JDOM. You can take a whole document and load it in memory. So you, you kind of, you're kind of stuck with this, uh, this kind of paradigm. I decided to use it because I'm learning Scala. It seemed kind of neat. Um, it was a little frustrating, but once you figure it out, it's pretty neat. There are some to-dos in there. Just pretend those aren't there. Um, and then load models. Uh, so you also have XPath parsing built in. So you can actually do XPath parsing in Scala. Um, there's some libraries out there that do JSON parsing the same way. You can import a JSON library and it will add in all your bare words. So you can do the same type of parsing with JSON as well. But the XPath stuff for XML is built in within Scala. Um, and so I also had a flat format which is used lots of places. So even though data is coming in, you can have multiple data uh, in a packet. You can have multiple sensors per packet. But really, they all get inserted as one record eventually when you normalize all the data and do all your left joins. So this is a model that just flattens it all out. And so I can extend that to get a CSV format for comma separated. And so we can see some of this nice uh, Scala uh, syntactic sugar, such as uh, reducing left on collection. So I can row reduce less on this row and give it a function to add in the commas and new lines. Same thing for tab delimited. And then I had an HTML trait. And um, yes, that is HTML text in a string in code. So don't judge me. I know you're judging me. Um, <laughs> but it's just for debugging, I promise. So models um, are pretty nice, too, in Scala. So notice we don't have all these getters and setters that you have to collapse down. Um, in Scala, you have properties. So you can just put all your properties out there, list them as vars, and access them as public fields. If at some point you need to add code behind this, if you need to do some manipulation on a getter set, just change those to a private variable and name your public function the same name as your private field, and it will work just the same. For your setter, you put an underscore in front of it. There's some great articles online that explain how that works. It has to do with the way that Scala deals with white space and underscores and functions. But you have this full property support. And it's, it's kind of sad because we're at Java 7 and we still don't really have properties. Properties are in C Sharp and Python with the property function in Ruby, and we still don't really have them in Java yet. So this is one nice thing that is in Scala. Uh, it's built in property types. So I won't go into the database stuff. It's pretty much just uh, querying the database. I didn't use a DIO. I decided to work with SQL queries instead. Um, Trade-offs, again, if you use a database extraction system, it's a lot easier to, uh, to, to definitely to switch between different databases. So you can write everything in your DAO, whether it's Spring or Hibernate HQL. As long as you write everything in your DAO, then you can plug in different database backends that it, that, that particular DAO supports, and it should just work. Or you find all the bugs between that DAO and that database backend. Um, for what I was doing, I just decided to write stuff in raw SQL, so I created all my retrieval functions and then implemented them. Um, so if you do need to interact with Java, if you do need to interact with things that depend on the set and get methods for beans, uh, there is a bean property annotation in Scala. You can add the bean property annotation, and in the bytecode, it will generate all your getters and setters correctly for your variables. So I'm doing some dependency injection here, so I use the bean property annotation. Uh, another thing is, since I'm, I'm doing stuff directly with data sources and connections instead of using a DAO, traditionally when you uh, work with this, you have to put, get the connection, make your query, and you have to put everything in a try box, make sure that you catch any exceptions, and you have to try to close the connection. You have to catch exceptions from that and then do a finally. Um, it's kind of an annoying pattern when you look at it. One advantage of Scala is that you, do, you can toss in functions into a function can take in a function. You have closures and yields. 
So this is an example taken um, off of this WordPress site where I define a using function, which is similar to, uh, I think it's a width function in C-sharp, or maybe it's called using for a closable. And so uh, I take in a closable, uh, define a close function uh, that returns a unit. A unit is a void in Scala. Um, with a type B, and then we redefine, we de define a closable over that type B. And then here we see in this try statement, you have get B. It's a little bit complex, but if you unroll it, if you unroll the closure, you get that same pattern you expect of try, run your connection, catch the exceptions, close it, do a finally if it doesn't close. And then you can see an example of running this query under list sensors. So I have this using DS get connection, and I run my query and get the results. Um, I also decided to uh, write my own system for uh, updating schemas. So there's two database users defined. One is just for queries, one is for updating the schema. And so the DDL user goes through the list of DDLs. They're all numbered 001, 002. Uh, the first one, which is, has three zeros, is a bootstrap that you have to put in manually. The rest it will try to load and uh, install uh, when the web app is deployed. There's also a SQL commands file. So I decided to just put all my SQLs, SQL statements in a command file. And that way I can support multiple databases by just adding more command files. So by default, it supports Microsoft SQL, and I started working on MySQL support as well. There are also converters. So there are only two converters implemented. One is for time zones. So everything in the database is stored in UTC. And so this convert things out to the correct time zone when you're doing a query. And then there is also metric to imperial conversions. Um, everything is stored in the database in metric. It can come in as imperial, but it'll be converted to metric. Um, with this converter, even if you put it in the database manually as imperial, it will go out as metric by default or imperial if you specify it. Because um, we were dealing with the city of Cincinnati, and some people like their units in gallons for some ridiculous reason. So there's also security. Um, I won't show you the code for that, but there's a blog post I put up on it. So uh, basically, I use RSA security. Um, and I had to figure out how to get this to work between Python and Java to sign things in Python and have it verified in Java. Um, if you're doing this in Python, do not use PY crypto, because it does not work or give you any type of signatures that you can verify in Java. Um, I'm not, I think the uh, padding doesn't, is not the same padding algorithm used in, in Java. So in Java, I'm using Legion of the Bouncy Castle. And so here we have, so here you see for the first time the XML envelope where you have a packet, a timestamp, it's a Unix timestamp, so it's in UTC, uh, sensor IDs, the type, um, the units. So here we have a sensor that's reporting 12 degrees Celsius. And at the bottom is a signature. That's basically the XML data signed. So there's um, spring glue that kind of holds this all together. So I'm using spring dependency injection. It's because I had used it before. I was used to spring dependency injection. If you're making stuff in Scala from scratch, you shouldn't really use spring dependency injection. If you look online, there's a bunch of articles on using a cake pattern. So uh, a cake pattern uses mixins and traits. And it does a really neat, uh, it's pretty clean dependency injection model using Scala. And you basically have one master class that links everything together with width statements. And the advantage is that everything is in code. So all your dependency injection, your application is constructed in code at that point. And so if there are any problems, um, you should see it at compile time. With Spring, um, you don't see that. You get a lot of, if you do a get object and the object doesn't exist, you get all kinds of exceptions in your logs. Um, unless you have an Eclipse plugin or an IntelliJ plugin that can read this application context and tell you which things do and don't exist. So here we see all the actions, um, and we see all the validators for those actions that are injected into it. Um, we see converters. Uh, here's our security manager. There are only two securities, uh, signature and none. All the validators, uh, the conversion list, all of our formats, uh, logging. So we use aspect-oriented programming for logging. So here, everything that uh, is in the org.bigsense package Whenever it's pulled from the spring file, if you get it out of the spring context, it, you don't actually get that class. You get a wrapper around it that's based on that trait or interface. And it implements all those functions. And so when you're calling a method, it's actually calling uh, my logging method first. So it does it before, logs, runs the application, then does an after, also catches exceptions as well, which makes logging a lot easier. Uh, for production, you can turn this off if it gets to be a performance hit. Uh, there's also a database handler, and here's where we specify the db commands file, which is injected by the ant build process. 
Um, so I specify a lot of my database stuff in this spring file. Um, most people who've worked with Java servlets, you'll usually specify that in the actual servlet layer. So in JBoss or Tomcat, there's an XML file where you can define your data sources and get those data sources by name. So this is a trade-off. Um, by specifying it within the servlet layer, you can then you can set your servlet layer to be your environment. This servlet layer, this Tomcat instance is meant for dev. This Tomcat instance is meant for staging. And the advantage is you can take the same WAR file and put it in any of those containers and it will immediately act like it should for that particular environment. Uh, this isn't just for database resources, but you can set up a uh, naming context for web service lookups, for anything else dealing specifically with that environment. Um, so with this, I was using, we were using Bamboo at first and then, then changed over to Jenkins. And so uh, with Jenkins, I had it set up to actually build different WAR files. So it built three different WAR files for dev, staging, and production. And so we had a, a sane process for building these new WAR files that are consistent. And that way, all of the servers were actually uh, identical. So the configuration was in the WAR file. This is a, a trade-off. Um, as I said, here I'm also specifying my pooling mechanism, which is BoneCP. I can change my pooling mechanism here to C3P0, whereas if I had to do this in the servlet layer, you'd have to change that within Tomcat or JBoss or WebSphere, which you can do. It's usually in XML files, but you still have to do that configuration at that point. So it comes down to if, you, if you're if you spinning up servers, you can do configuration uh, automatically using Puppet or CF Engine and do it on the server side or do it within the build process. And I decided to do that within the build process. So you've seen all these components, and you're like, well, how do I call something in your web service? You have a lot of components, but I'm not sure how they fit together. So this is a basic query string. Um, the context root of the application, the main servlet, so my master servlet, I just have the path of API going to it. The action name, uh, the parameters, the format, and then uh, any get variables after it for conversions. Um, so there's, here's a function matrix of most of the, the actions that are implemented. There are lots of query actions for getting the sensors, getting relay names. Um, there are also a lot of aggregate functions. So the aggregate functions have, like for average temp over a date range. So I can say between this and this date, within this week, I want the average temperatures um, say within a window of 1,440 minutes, which is one day. And so that way, it'll, the return results will be the average temperature for that day. And we'll see why aggregates are important for this experiment setup in, in a moment. Um, also, here are all of our formats and the documentation for them and which ones are supported for, for which function types. And also, you have constraints, which are passed in just like conversions. So constraints are if I only want to see one sensor ID, one relay ID, or one sensor type. And then here we have our converters. So the master servlet is what bootstraps all of this together. It creates our application construct. It creates our request objects, pulls the body, pulls the parameters, checks our formats, loads them into data models if it needs to, checks the security if there is any, does our validation, finally runs the action, and then displays a response. So uh, for people who've used frameworks, if you haven't had to call a JSP page directly, this is how it's done in that framework uh, behind the scenes. Get servlet context, get request dispatcher, and then the actual JSP page, um, which I do in here. So most frameworks we use have some type of servlet like this that pulls everything together and that, that bootstraps everything. So here I'm getting my full path so I can use it in links going forward. Um, then we're constructing our request objects. We're getting our method, our arguments pulling the request body, pulling the signature if there is one, getting the data, getting the parameters, uh, getting the action out of the spring context. So one thing you'll notice is that I'm doing a spring lookup for an object and I'm actually getting this from the URL. And so immediately some of you are thinking, isn't that a security problem? You're letting user input determine which bean you get from spring. Potentially, yes. Um, every bean is prefixed with action. That's, that's a controller. So you could get the wrong bean if you have another bean that has a second action word in it, or if you find an exploit within Spring where you can trick it into getting another bean. So this could potentially be a problem. Our web service sat uh, behind the firewall. We had an application on top of it that read from it, but this is a legitimate kind of security concern. Uh, it kind of worked for what we had here. Format is done the same way. Um, loaded all of our models here uh, based on the format, if we had a format and then uh, security manager to verify the security, validate the, the inputs to make sure we have sane input coming into our action, and finally, we run the action, we generate the headers that need, that need to go into the response, 
put in the response, uh, set over output streams, reselector view, so forth. And then finally, after all of this is done, if there are any errors, we need to give the appropriate error message to the web browser. So we catch all of our exceptions. And in Scala, we can see how we catch exceptions. In the catch, they have case statements. So you can actually catch multiple exceptions. And it's a slightly cleaner syntax than in Java. So let me go ahead and show you a demo of this. So the demo will be based around uh, the SQL Server implementation. So let me go ahead and, all right, so Tomcat has stopped. I'll go ahead and start tailing the logs. All right, so I'll go, go ahead and also show the uh, database creation process. So let me go ahead and delete the existing database. And delete our users. All right, so the only DDL that needs to be loaded manually is this bootstrap file. It creates the databases and sets our users for them. Uh, here I'm just using the same password, db underscore big sense. Alright, so that's created. Then we'll start up our Tomcat instance. And this is the part where the demo doesn't work, and I try to figure out what's wrong. If I know, I guess. Yeah, it should be running. I'm not sure why my log's empty. Uh, service is up. So if we look at our database, do a refresh. It has actually created all of our tables for us. And so this does have an automated tester in it. That I wrote. The automated tester is written in Python 3. So I could run this tester. and we see a bunch of OKs. So uh, early on, I started doing automated testing on this. The tester is actually written in Python, and it's, it's so helpful going forward, because as I'm building out more stuff in the framework, um, if I break something, it shows up almost immediately. Um, if I deploy something into production and the test didn't show that it broken, I can add in a new test to make sure that doesn't happen in the future. So I have tests for all kinds of things, from status messages to the number of rows on the responses, um, uh, test that posts some sensor data, just one row, test that posts multiple sensor packages, um, test that some of these te uh, tests for all the invalid stuff, uh, invalid responses, 400, 405s, um, so forth and so forth, uh, tests that actually check the XPath expression. So I'm actually qu querying some of the XPL that comes back and make sure that I'm getting the correct number of elements. Um, they're about over, they're close to 200 tests in this whole suite. And then also looking at the actual client. So the client is called LittleSense, and I won't really get into that except to run it and to demo it. LittleSense PY, put in debugging mode, give it a configuration file, local. Oh, and this is written in Python 2. Uh, we're working with OpenWRT. Python 2 has uh, Python 2 mini that's embeddable. There's no miniature Python 3 yet. So we're still using. And so there, there's some neat stuff to the, to the client as well. It has some dependency injection and uh, logging as well. 
And so here we see, uh, I don't have any sensors hooked into my laptop, obviously, so these are virtual sensors. Um, this one randomly generates temperature and volume and flow rates, uh, size the data, and so we can see this is getting sent directly to the locally running instance. And if we go over here, we can see that data coming. So here we see data coming from both the Uh, data coming from both the uh, test client I showed you and also coming from that uh, st client that's running. So we can also see a live demo. And this is data, hopefully it will come up. This is data coming from the, the service that's running at the Green Learning Station. So if we can't really see it up here. So if we look at this function, we're calling, uh, we're aggregating, we're taking the sum of the volumes for a date range, so it's for these two date ranges, for a value of 1,440 minutes, one day, so these are all by day, and we're giving it to us in table HTML format. So here we see the volume in gallons, um, it's the standard, let's change that to metric. And so these are for sensors 1 through 6 for that date range, and then sensors 1 through 6 for the next date, and so forth and so forth, and the, the daily totals for that. All right. And that's in case the demo didn't actually work. Uh, screenshot of it. So uh, the key in this is the aggregate function. So these are counting sensors, and the way that the counting sensors work, one of the limitations of this is that the counts are all based off of the number of clicks of the sensor. And so we're taking the total volume since we started measuring data. So if we've started, say, in March 1st, and you do a query, and the latest says that we have 141 kiloliters of water, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's just a number. And that's actually the amount of water that we've gotten since we started the experiment. And so aggregation allows us to break that apart by week or by hour or by day. And that gives us more meaningful numbers. This is really important because with these sensor networks, because we have this pit and it's being filled up with water and this float is being triggered in order to pump water out, if we have a mild rain event, if we get less than two or three millimeters of water, none of these uh, pumps are going to get triggered. All these uh, areas are just being filled up with water. And so now when the next rain event happens, we're getting kind of the last week's water as well when the pump is finally triggered. If we aggregate over a large enough period, like a week, we kind of see a good correlation between the actual rain and the amount of water that's being pumped out of these pits. Um, so every time the pump is triggered, we actually should see about 227 liters or 60 gallons of water being pumped out of each pit should have a variance of plus or minus uh, 20 gallons, about 76 liters. So there are a lot of limitations with the way that this experiment was done. One of the limitations was the way that the pavement monitoring was done and the pumping. Um, so we're, we're getting the amount of water being pumped out of this sewer pit, and it may not necessarily be a good indicator of how much water is really uh, coming from runoff versus being saturated um, through this permeable uh, pavement. We try to, to mitigate that using aggregation. We also had some problems with interference. Uh, we check our data, like when we first got data streaming, we're like, all right, this is awesome. And then suddenly we saw over 140 kiloliters of water coming through each minute. And we're like, that can't be right. And when we started taking a look at it, putting in a spreadsheet and subtracting it, we saw the same amount of water coming through each time. We figured that it was interference with the magnets. Um, we figured out it was coming at a rate of about 60 hertz, so it was definitely some kind of electronic interference. Um, underneath the Green Station site, they had wiring for uh, electronic vehicle recharging stations that they never put in. Um, we thought that there might have still been power going to that, which might have been causing a problem. Uh, we're across the street from a radiation treatment center which probably has a lot of electromagnetic fields. Um, so a lot of work was done. We shortened the wires, we added additional shielding, and we got to the point where we got rid of most of this interference. We also had problems from backflow, where we'd see small amounts of water coming back through, which shouldn't be possible. We should only see large amounts every time a pump was triggered. And so we figured that water was actually coming back from, it was being pumped into something called a bioswell, which is just a whole bunch of soil that's meant to absorb water. And we figured some of the stuff may have actually been coming back and flipping the counter the other way. 
Um, and we also had problems with the stoppers. So the way that the, the contractors built the site, their stoppers, I think they were meant as kind of just a, a security thing, just in case you had overflows, where you had a pipe coming back from bioswale into the pits. And uh, there was a problem with just a, a lot of that water building pressure. Some of them would come towards the center. And so especially the middle one, the control one, the stopper would actually pop off because there was so much pressure. And these are pretty big stoppers. And so you'd get a bunch of water being dumped back in that was just pumped out. And you had a literal infinite loop of water just continually being pumped. And you'd see, you know, gigaliters being pumped at a time and a lot of electricity being used. And, and it's just this, this cycle of water. Um, there's some vestigial components to the service. Um, so that's because of the, the way that the counting was done. So each counting sensor is actually sent as two different sensors. I send a, a flow rate sensor and a volume sensor. The volume sensor just multiplies the bucket size times the count. Um, and then the flow rate sensor actually divides by the sample rate to get the, the flow rate per second. And so we had this idea of moving some of that into the web service and having it so the, 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 the uh, router would just send the count and not send um, any of this calculated data, especially when we had all these weird variances happening with, with our interference. Uh, there were concerns on, you know, is there something wrong with the software in the router, and like, there's not anything wrong with the software in the router. So this idea of putting in the counts into the web service and then having some way, write a web application to configure it and say that this sensor has this particular value, um, this had an advantage because under the current implementation, if you had two sensors plugged in that were both counting sensors in the current uh, Python client, it could only have one count associated with it. So you couldn't have two buckets of different sizes or two tipping sensors of different sizes hooked into the same router. And that was kind of a limitation, not without putting the individual sensor ID in there. Um, so we had this idea of moving it to the web service. It never really happened. Um, there were also attempts with imaging sensors where we send images to the web service. So I created this idea of uh, non-commissioned units, non-commissioned counting units, non-commissioned uh, imaging units, uh, NSTAR units. And so those are still there. They're not really used. And also all of our spatial data is, is static. So it's actually in the DDLs. Um, we had uh, uh, our site manager, Quinn, went around with a really high-powered GPS and got exact measures for all of our sensors. The eventual goal, uh, one of the original goals that, that one of the professors that we were working with wanted was to just have a box that had a GPS on it. And so we could just move the sensor box anywhere and, and turn it on and it could tell us its location and it could automatically configure, register itself and start transmitting data. So you have something that's just an auto calibrating sensor unit. Um, so in the future, that's one thing that we want to support is this idea of just having an uh, automated box that would report itself and have automatic calibrating sensors, hopefully getting away from these counting sensors, moving on to uh, different types of sensors. Um, another thing that we really, that, that's missing from this web service is having asynchronous database handling. So if you need a large amount of data, if I'm querying you know, several days worth of data, this is you know, several megs or sometimes hundreds of megs, currently it has to perform that entire database request, hold it in memory, and then send it to us. And if it's large enough, you can just run out of RAM doing that. And thanks, before the, before the servlet 3.0 spec in Tomcat 7, um, there are lots of hacky ways to do asynchronous requests, um, spotting off your new threads and things like that. Uh, starting with Tomcat 7 and servlet 3, you can now all do this within servlet in a standard way. And so we could actually spawn off the database request in a separate thread um, within the servlet layer, and then it could put everything to a buffer, and we just read from the buffer and output to the browser. It would save us a lot of memory, and it would be a lot faster. Um, so those are some of the things in supporting more sensor types uh, that we want to add going into the future. There are other people who have done stuff like this. Uh, recently, um, Andrew, who is the PhD student who got me involved, sent me information on Data Turbine, which is a Java web service. It's open source. You can download it, run it yourself. And it's meant to handle all types of data collection, not just sensors. So you can just send it raw data, and it can uh, pull all the data, aggregate it. I think you can do graphs as well. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce the second one, PostTube, I think. Um, I believe that's all hosted. I don't think they have a downloadable component, but it does the same type of thing. We can send data, it creates graphs. Um, the trade-offs to both of these, of course, um, if anyone was using Google Reader, uh, we know what it's like to have major service out there that suddenly might not be there anymore. So the trade-offs with having something that you can download and use versus something that's out there where the API can change all the time.
So uh, most of the research I've talked about, we're, we ha it's pending publication right now, and it should be in the International Journal of Digital Earth, hopefully within the next few months if we survive the peer review process. Um, and and there are several con uh, contributors to that, me, Andrew, uh, Quinn, our site manager, uh, Carmen, who did our statistics, and uh, Professor um, uh, Richard Beck, who uh, gave us a lot of support going in with our editor and actually provided all the original servers uh, at the University of Cincinnati for this project. Uh, the source code is all up on GitHub. Um, it's listed under the Big Sense, Big Sense Tester, and LT Sense. And uh, that's it. So, any questions? You didn't talk all that much about Scala, um, <laughs> but just wondered what your uh, what impressions you've got about using Scala for the kind of project compared to Java or other languages. Scala is really nice because it, it can interact with all the components within Java. But I mean, really, Gro Groovy and, and JRuby and the others can do that as well. Um, I didn't use a lot of the functional aspects of Scala. So there's a lot of stuff in there that you can do with closures and yields um, that are really nice. I treated it just as, as a straightforward procedural languages in most cases. A bit of Java. Yeah, and, and it really adds in a lot of syntax that should have been in Java 7. Like Java 7, if it had properties and if it had closures, some of these basic things, it would have been really nice. And Scala seems to add in a lot of those really nice things that, that really just should have been part of the language at this point. And that's what I got out of it. And did you have any pitfalls with Scala? Um, the, there's some interesting things about Scala. Their collections by default are immutable, and the mutable ones have the same names. So you get into interesting things when you import both of them to the same space. Um, so they have this idea when you de define an object, you really shouldn't change it through, and that goes with kind of the functional way of, of dealing with things. And also moving between collections. So if you're moving between Java and Scala, um, they have some built-in functions to, to translate between like Java maps and Scala maps, but they're not the same maps at all. So you do have to convert back and forth. And those got a bit tricky and frustrating at, on times. And I was on Stack Overflow a lot trying to figure out a lot of that stuff. If you're doing it again, would you, would you do um, I'm not sure. I, I think I'd look at some of these other web services out there that kind of do this already. We looked at some of the open stuff for, I think it was Water ML, and there, there weren't any implementations of it at the time. We talked about using things like Water ML instead, which is an XML structured language for dealing with water sensor data. And the, the, the standards were just really complex, and it was hard finding impl implemented libraries. Um, today we'll probably just do all the do a bunch of research beforehand and see what was out there, um, and and if some of this other stuff, data turbine turns out to be really well done and already support most of what I need, we might go to that in the future. If not, I might just continue working on this the way it is and implement a lot of things that that I kind of want in it going forward. Karen, question: How about we see this other new um, I'm not sure. I've done a lot of work with Play recently. Um, for a web application, I definitely would use a framework. Um, with Play 2, I really like what, what it can do for, for, web, app, for web apps. For web services, um, I, I kind of want to look at Play 2 because it supports the anasynchronous stuff built in. Um, and I would probably look at that heavily before I decided to, to build a framework again. But overall, building the framework wasn't, wasn't too bad. And the advantage of it is that when you learn a new framework, there is a big learning curve of learning how to do everything in that framework. Whereas if you build it yourself, you know how it's all set up, you know where its limitations are, but then you are having to build out a lot more. No, I haven't used Actors or Act uh, at all in this. Yeah, so it's, it's set up for uh, SQL Server um, in this demo, and I started working on a MySQL piece as well. Um, yeah, that is one thing that we talked about later on was moving. So if you wanted to, so with the way it's set up, um, as long as your database has fairly sane syntax, you can just create a new commands file and create your new DDLs, and it should just work. I'm working on getting the MySQL piece working right now. If you want to switch to uh, some type of NoSQL document storage system, such as Cassandra or Mongo, uh, you'd have to. You could still just re-implement the uh, the trait, the data source, data trait, database handler trait, and it should work. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, cool. Uh, it's, um, it's well, what's that called? Squirrel. Squirrel. Okay. Cool. I think I've heard of that. Yeah. Um, You are operating directly to JDC. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And some other things. So you didn't find so much issue just interoperating or calling up the standard JDB, uh, standard Java API from Scala. Um, no, it was all good. It does mostly work, yeah. I mean, like in my experience, it seems to be pretty straightforward from Scala to Java. The harder it is actually the other way around. If you want your Java to hold your Scala, there are a lot of stuff like in Scala that you can't be called. Or you can't call it, but it's really, like, really bad. <laughs> you can't call it. But you're like, go for it. So if you want to write Scala code for Java clients, Yes. So, yeah. for example, like what Play, what Play Framework doesn't have for us is that they actually provide a thin layer. So the core is done in Scala and not in Play, but they provide a little thin layer, so um, it's easier for Java developers to use it. And most of the times, it's you know, it's so hard sometimes for Java, so they just you know, provide us annotations. So normally in Scala, you would want annotations. You normally use these closures there to actually. Sometimes Scala code is actually longer than Java code, but the difference is the Scala code is on compile time. You can actually see the mistakes, unlike on, on Java, as uh, you know, the spring. The problem only occurs when you run it. Right? And on Scala, like with the key pattern, it can compile or with the parsing of JSON stuff. It's impossible for you to actually push it over, you just come on, go work, because it's not going to come back. Okay. Yeah, I've noticed that would play too, like you have the dot .api package and the non-api, so one's the Java packages, yeah. one's the Scala packages. Okay, cool. Thanks, Josh.